Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Oh, my name's Jason. I'm an alcoholic. I got to get some amends out of the way. We usually thank people, but I need to make an amends to Margo. She was supposed to pick because she was at the airport for three hours waiting for me, and I just got in a cab and came here. So I apologize for that, right? Phew. Alice. I owe her an amends because 23 years ago, I was, the, uh, I was serving ice cream at an intergroup picnic. It's a lot of work, right? It's, it's a hard job. You have to reach down into a, like a cooler and get the ice cream out one at a time and hand them to people. That are, and uh, I was overwhelmed. I was sweating. And uh, I hear this lady go, hey, do you have any sherbet? And I said, all the old ladies ate the sherbet. <laughs> yeah, everybody in the whole section did that. And I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> and she's everywhere, right? And I could be in the middle of nowhere, and I hear, where's my sherbet? I'm like, oh. I just start sweating, right? So when she got up here to talk, I looked at Laura, and I said, this isn't going to be good. This is <laughs> This, this is going to go sideways really fast, right? And uh, I'm grateful you guys did the countdown before I, my talk, because if somebody had one day, I'd feel guilty about that. Um, so that's great. I want to thank the committee for inviting me here. It's been an honor and privilege to be here. I know I'm kind of a wild card, and uh, I didn't prepare for the uh, whatever that thing was this morning, the panel. I was a little shocked when I sat next to Larsina and she had notes and photocopies and stuff underlined and highlighted, and I'm just trying to figure out what the topic is, right? <laughs> oh, man, yes. Thank you, Scott, for a great talk. And Larsine, I, I, I just hate following you, right? Because you give a better talk than most AA people do, right? And, uh, and I love you for that. You know, Lisa, I don't know, but at least you moved up to the front. All right, let's do this thing. My sobriety date's 11.30.07. My sponsor is a guy named Carl Morris. He was here for a little bit, but then he heard I was talking tonight, and he left, right? <laughs> so that's not a good sign right there when your sponsor leaves. I am his favorite, right? I mean, I'm self-appointed, but I am his favorite, right? And uh, he would tell you, he calls me for Christ's sakes, Jason, right? Because it's, uh, yeah. It could go either way. It could go, if he rubs his head like that, I'm probably in trouble, right? Unless he knows, he goes like this, and he'll go, for Christ's sake, Jason. And that means I'm going to owe somebody an amends, right? Or he might go, for Christ's sake, Jason. And then sometimes he just yells at me, for Christ's sake. So we have these little bobbleheads that uh, my sponsorship line gave us. It has his, my bobblehead and his bobblehead, and it says, for Christ's sake, Jason. So that's who I am in that sponsorship line. Uh my home group's called Sandy's Kitchen. We meet on Thursday, or Tuesday nights in Happy Valley, Oregon at 7 o'clock. A lot of the guys from my group are here, and I appreciate that. My wife sent them here because she's not here with me. Um, I don't know what that's all about, but we'll figure it out, right? And uh, if you're ever in the state of Oregon and you need a meet of Alcoholics Anonymous, or you know somebody needs a meet of Alcoholics Anonymous, please call me. If I can't get to that meet of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'll get somebody to them. You know, uh, and everything I have in my life, it's a value and a good as a result of Alcoholics Anonymous. To the new guy with one day, you're wanted, welcome, and needed in Alcoholics Anonymous, right? And there's, there's two things. I might go on a tangent. You never know. So I want you to know this much. This is what I got in my heart today is Alcoholics Anonymous works and God is real, right? And when I got here, I didn't believe that. Um, all right. So I think that covers everything. I've been polite to everybody. Larsen just <laughs> Larsine said, yeah, you can get going now, right? She said, whatever you do, don't screw up, screw up the ice cream social and run long. So I got some boundaries. Uh, my mom and dad got divorced when I was really young. Uh, my dad took off. My mom was a hippie. I used to say she was an old hippie, but she was like 22. Uh, the reason I know she was a hippie, she smelled like a hippie, right? That patchouli smell or whatever that is, right? Yeah, I know a few people that smell like that, right? Triggers me. But... We live up in the woods with a bunch of other hippies. And the reason I know they were hippies is because they smelled like hippies. 
And uh, we lived in a teepee once. I remember living in a school bus before it was popular. We lived in a uh, we lived in a log cabin. And what I found out later on is my mom grew pot for a living. And somebody stood in line and told me it's cannabis. It's not called pot. So whatever you want to call it, it was illegal, right? And uh, and what we'd do is during the day everybody did what they had to do, and at night they would start drinking and they start beating on each other. They obviously forgot they were hippies, right? And uh, what I would see is I see my mom get beat up on a regular basis. Right? But I'm here to tell you I see my mom beat up somebody on a regular basis. Right, But the, I didn't know there was anything wrong with that because every morning they'd be hugging each other and telling each other they loved each other. Right, And so I didn't know there was something. I, I knew that was odd. Right, and it, and it gave me some life skills when I got older. It taught me how when I felt that tension come and learn how to de-escalate it by talking or run and hide. And those are the skills I had. And, I, and I, again, I didn't know there was anything different about living up in the woods with a bunch of people. Uh, when I started going to school, kindergarten, my mom moved to town, and my mom's town house was a party house. It was one of those houses at 2 o'clock in the morning, there might be 20 people there. At 2 o'clock in the morning, I might be the only person there as a little kid. I learned how to make popcorn on the stove. I learned macaroni and cheese on the stove. I learned how to draw my own bath, and I learned how to survive when it got dark outside. Right? When it got dark outside, you pull all the blinds down, you turn every single light in the house on, and you turn the TV up really loud. That way, if somebody comes to break in, they're going to think there's a party there, and they're going to kill the neighbors. It worked, right? I mean, I did good at it, right? But that was my life. Again, I didn't know somebody. I didn't know there was Leave It to Beaver. I didn't know people read bed stories to their kids. I didn't know anything that. And I was okay with the way my life was. I didn't know any difference, so I didn't have anything to judge it by. But I remember I was getting ready to go into the first grade, and uh, it was a Sunday before school starts, and I was at home watching this show called Happy Days. Oh, for Christ's sake, some of you are older than me, right? <laughs> Jesus. So I'm watching this show called Happy Days, and the phone rings. And it's not like today where it goes to voicemail. It rang until those people give up, right? <laughs> it, it rang all the way till commercial, right? So somebody on the other line is dedicated, right? So I figured I better answer it. And I answered it. It's my grandma. And I don't know if there's any grandmas in here, but you guys are way too invested in your grandkids' lives, right? <laughs> I mean, you're asking questions like, are you excited to go to school? Do you have your clothes laid out? Have you, got your, have you wore your new shoes? I mean, stuff has absolutely nothing to do with happy days. <laughs> and uh, I'm just answering yes because I need to get off the phone, and she's just she's on a tangent, you know what I mean? And uh, finally, I said, Grandma, I got to go. My show's back on. And she said, sweetie, let me talk to your mom. I said, oh, my mom's not here. She's at the tavern. The phone number's 282-4440. <laughs> Call that number. This guy Floyd's going to answer the phone. Ask for Darla. And she's going to come to the phone and tell you she's having one more pitcher of beer and she'll be home. And uh, there was like a long pause and my show's on, right? And so I said, Grandma, I got to go. And she said, sweetie, give me that number. And I gave it to her again. And uh, she said, when you're done watching your show, I want you to go to bed. And when you get up to go to school in the morning, I want you to listen to what the teacher says and be nice to the other kids. Basically, that's what Carl tells me today, right? <laughs> Jesus, Jason, just be kind to others and generous with your time, and you should be all right. And, uh, and I said, okay, and I hung up that phone, and now I'm watching this show called The Vernon Shirley. <laughs> Obviously, a lot more people watch that than Happy Days, right? And, uh, and uh, there's a knock at the door, right? And I kind of stop what I'm doing, and they start beating on the door, man, and I panic, and I crawl underneath the coffee table because I know I'm going to die. And all of a sudden, they start beating on the window, and I, I, I just know it's over, right? And all of a sudden, I hear this chasing, open the door, it's Grandma. And I got relief, right? I don't know what that feeling is. I went and got out from that table, I opened up that door, and my grandma's standing there, and she didn't look like Grandma. She looked like she'd been crying. She looked mad. She just didn't have the Grandma vibe going on, right? And, uh, <laughs> and she said, sweetie, get your stuff. You're coming to live at my house. Oh, that's like hitting the lottery, right? You go to Grandma's house, there's Rice Krispie treats. There's, ho- there's cookies, there's homemade popsicles, there's sheets on the bed, the sheets match the pillowcase. But here's the deal, most importantly, there's somebody there all the time. That's not a hard sell for a little kid, man. I grab my stuff, I jumped in her car, we get to her house, I run up the stairs, I'm headed to the kitchen because that's where the stuff is, right? And as I'm running through the front room, I hear this, hey! I turn around, it's my grandpa. He's like, what are you doing here? I was like, man, I live here now. <laughs> I found out later my grandma didn't run it by him, right? <laughs> Back then, you just did what you did. Grandma's rule, right? But this is what he did. He looked right at me. He said, yeah, you do, buddy. Come here. And he gave me a hug, and I fell asleep on that man's lap for the next four or five years every single night because he made me feel safe, right? And, uh, man, I wasn't an easy kid. I ended up in AA, right? 
I, I, look, my grandma would drop me off at Sunday school and just say he has an enthusiasm for life, and then she'd jet down the hall, right? <laughs> my grandpa would drop me off somewhere, and I remember as a little kid him dropping me off, and he'd tell these people, don't let his cuteness get in the way of your common sense. <laughs> He's either going to be in trouble or talking his way out of trouble, right? And he would jet off, right? And I remember as a little kid thinking, that's odd. But uh, look, this is... I remember being in the third grade Miss Bo's class, and on Friday, everybody was going to dress up for what they want to be when they grow up, right? So Wednesday, we're all sitting in class, and it's the third grade, and she's going around, and people want to be president of the United States, doctors, lawyers, policemen, firemen. And she got to me, and she said, Jason, what are you going to be when you grow up? I said, a bank robber. <laughs> came out, I was just as shocked as she was, right? And uh, two of my friends changed their occupation, so I had a gang just like that, and... Uh, <laughs> And, uh, you know, I went home with a note that day, and I came back as a rodeo clown. But that's a whole other story, right? And, uh, and I remember uh, that weekend sitting under the apple tree with Stevie, and uh, he was going to be a policeman, uh, and I was going to be a bank robber. And he goes, yeah, and we talked about it. And I said, man, there's no banks on our block to practice with, right? And he said, there's a Kool-Aid stand, and this is when I got my first police contact, right? I, <laughs> I was uh, in the third grade. I went and got a BB gun, a bandana, and a cowboy hat, and I rode my bike up to the corner of Kool-Aid stand, and I robbed it, right? <laughs> if you're going to rob a Kool-Aid stand, you're a little old, but I'm going to give you some advice. They don't have no money. <laughs> they, they just have Kool-Aid in cups, right? But I watched TV, and I, I, I watched uh, something where they took people hostage and held them for ransom. So I took a kid hostage, and I took him back, and I tied him up to my clothesline pole, and I told all the other kids to go home and get their piggy banks and bring me their money. And, uh, but here's the thing. At 5 o'clock at my house, my grandma yells, dinner. You don't go eat dinner, you don't eat. I hear dinner. I told this young man, I'll be back in about 20 minutes. I got to go. <laughs> so I put my bandana down, my cowboy hat, my BB gun, and I set it next to him, and I went inside, and I was eating dinner, and uh, a police officer came. Yeah, it went bad really fast. And in the early 80s, uh, probably early 70s, I think, late 70s, when an officer showed up in your neighborhood, the whole neighborhood showed up, right? It, it's not like today where everybody just ducks. I mean, everybody comes out when there's an officer, right? And there's a lot of people in my backyard. Well, my grandma's backyard, not my backyard. And I'm trying to explain to him that the knots wouldn't be that tight if he wasn't squirming around. And, uh, and all of a sudden, my grandpa starts laughing, like, really loud, Right? And my grandma says, what's so funny? He goes, man, you can't make this up. And so everybody started laughing. And uh, it sent her in a tailspin, right? And she got, man, i never seen another man like this. She said, get in that house. You're grounded for a month. Whoa, so now I'm crying. But here's where my grandpa and I's relationship changed. He said, hold on a second. He took my grandma behind the house because you don't argue with, in front of public, I guess, it was back then, right? He come back and he said, here's the deal. I didn't tie that young man up to the clothesline pole. There's no need to punish me by grounding you to the inside of the house for a month. <laughs> You're grounded to the block. And I was like, yeah, that guy became my hero, man. He, he, he taught me when you get caught to share in a general way. And, uh, you know, we had a good time until I got a little bit older. Then he became a problem, right? What I found out, I just don't think he liked me, right? I think he hated me, really. Because every time I get in trouble, he'd tell the police where I worked, where I lived, and how much money I made, right? And he didn't even hesitate. And uh, as I got older, I, I grew away from him. What I know today is he was a good man. He's the kind of guy, if he dropped a quarter on the ground, he'd spend a dollar to get it back to you if he knew it was yours. Right? He was just a decent human being. And he had a young man that was out of whack. Uh, my grandma, on the other hand, I, th I thought she felt sorry for me. Right? As a little kid, I just thought she felt sorry for me. And I remember being in the sixth grade, and we had, got bus to, in buses to middle schools. And uh, you're going to find this hard to believe, but I got kicked off the bus. And, uh, and uh it was my first day to walk home, and I was kind of depressed. And I was walking out, and I see my grandma walk in. I said, oh, she's here to save me. She said, no, sweetie, we need to go into the office and talk to some people. And I said, okay. And so we go in there, and there's a round table, and there's a, uh, my principal, a teacher, a lady from a special needs school, and a couple counselors. And they sat on one side of the table, and there was two chairs, and we sat down. And they proceeded to tell my grandma everything I'd done wrong in that three months of school that I didn't show any self-control, that I hit other kids, that I didn't have respect for him. I mean, they sound, I sounded kind of bad, right? And I remember uh, she, the one teacher said, he can't even read or write at this level. I don't know what he's doing in this school. And uh, my grandma hadn't said anything, right? She didn't even, I mean, she wasn't doing her job, right? I didn't think. And when she got done, she said, may I say something? And I go, oh, thank God. 
They said, yeah. She said, look, I, I'm not going to deny Jason did any of those things. He lives at my house. He's a tough kid, but he's a good kid, and there's a good kid inside of there. And the reason I know this is every morning on his way to school, he runs down to Mrs. Harrington's house, and he throws her newspaper up on the front porch so she doesn't have to come down the stairs. And Shane, the young man who's simple-minded, every time I see him at church on Sunday at the grocery store, the first thing he asks is, where's Jason? Because nobody picks on him when Jason's around, and always, Jason always picks him first for sports when they're picking teams. Nobody told him to do those things. He did them on his own. So I know there's a good kid inside of there, and I think we need to find that and not him find us. And I ended up having my best school year that year. But I remember walking out of that office and walking down that hallway and looking up at my grandma for the first time and believing somebody loved me. I had never felt that before in my life. I knew somebody loved me no matter what. Right? And I went wherever that lady went. Right? And, uh, you know, I probably should get drunk or Larcino get mad about ice cream. Um, that kid, Sean, I tied up to the clothesline pole, became one of my best friends. I must need Alan on. Right? I took him hostage right off the bat, baby. And uh, we went over to my friend Leif's house, and we were going to sleep in Leif's backyard. State of Oregon, you don't sleep in the backyard a lot, but it, it was a Friday night. We're in the backyard setting up for our night, and Leif's mom comes out and says, hey, I ordered you guys a pizza. There's $10 on the counter. Pay the pizza guy when he gets here and stay in the house. The adults are going bold. We're like, sweet, right? Because when you're in the sixth grade and somebody gives you a telephone and a house, oh, the world is going to change, and refrigerators are running, right? You know what I mean? And... Uh, and so the pizza came, we paid the pizza guy, he left, and we sat down, and Leif said, pizza tastes better with beer. I said, yes, it does. I had never drank beer before, but I'm all in, baby. And he went downstairs, and he brought up this case of Lucky Lager beer. It's nasty, right? Yeah, yeah these must be from the Northwest, right? I'm pretty sure that stuff, I almost swore like you, Larsine, that stuff don't even exist anymore. But uh, what happened was I, I took that drink. I didn't get that feeling, of, ooh, ah, I arrived. I had to plug my nose and hang in there, right? And within about an hour, I understand what alcohol did for me, man, because we're in the backyard throwing rocks at cars and having a great time, right? And, uh, man, all of a sudden, I got food poisoning, right? I'm just sicker than a dog, man. And I told my buddies, I got to go home, man. That pizza, there was something wrong with it, right? And so I rode my, home, my bike home, which Leif said was my first DUI. But uh, I made her, and I had no police contact then. But I got to my house. I went into my room, and I told my grandma I don't feel good. And she looked at me kind of like in disgust. And I was sick all night, right? And she didn't do her job, right? She didn't get a nightlight. She didn't get a towel for the pillow. She didn't put a garbage. She just, she didn't exist, really. I don't know what she was doing. And uh, I'm sick all night, and I finally fall asleep. And I wake up the next morning, and my grandpa's at the end of my bed yelling, get up, you got to go to work. I said, I don't have a job. He said, get up, you got to go to work. I said, I don't think I really feel that good. And he said, if you're going to drink like a big boy, you're going to work like a big boy. Now let's go. And uh, as I'm walking out, I thought my grandma would save me, but she handed me a warm egg salad sandwich and a thermos of warm milk and told me have a great day. Right? Yeah. And we went and picked up Leif and Sean, who looked just as bad as I did, and my grandpa took us to pick strawberries. It is against the law for 12, 12 years and younger to pick strawberries in the state of Oregon. You're welcome. Because that's brutal, right? I'm picking strawberries, getting sick, picking strawberries, getting sick, and he's, in, he's on the tailgate laughing at me. And uh, I looked at my buddies. I said, man, I'm not drinking anymore. And they said, you didn't like the alcohol? I said, I don't mind the alcohol. I just don't want to work, right? <laughs> so I quit cold turkey. No AA, no 12 steps, no treatment. I I'm good, right? You got me. Work is the problem. And, uh, but here's what happened. This is how I know, because when I got into the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, this is where the obsession and the allergy really kicked in for me. Because I got to high school, man, and I started saving my lunch money Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, pitching in with some other guys and drinking on the weekend. You know, we played sports on the weekdays and we drank on the weekends. Nobody was dying of a heroin overdose. Nobody was getting in trouble. We just had great times, right? And that's what we did, and, uh, and life was good. But on uh, May 5th, 1989, I, well, Carl says I have to tell you the truth, and Larsine's here. So I stole the motorcycle, right? I used to say I borrowed it. I stole the motorcycle, and I got in a high-speed chase, I guess, and I woke up. I crashed, right? I was probably, and I woke up in an uh, ICU unit up on a hill, not knowing what happened, right? And I, and, and I started screaming, I'm alive, and a nurse came in, and I asked her what happened. She said, you're on a drunk driving accident on a motorcycle. I said, I don't own a motorcycle. She said, we know. Um, <laughs> I said, am I going to die? She said, you're not going to die, but you're probably going to lose your left leg, and if you don't lose your left leg, you'll never walk normal again. But I'm okay with that. 
right? I just don't want to die. And uh, I got out of that hospital telling myself I'll never drink alcohol or put anything else in my body ever again. Two weeks out of that hospital, man, I don't know how to get rid of that anxiety, that fear, and that embarrassment, so I drink, right? And I just keep lowering my standards to keep up with my quality of life, right? So eventually I'm living at somebody's uncle's house until the police come, and then nobody knows whose house it is, right? One of those that has no power, no water, but it seems like a good place to stay. And that's where I was living, you know, and about once every month, one of my uncles would show up at my house or my, my house, my tent or whatever I was living in to drag me down to a pay phone and make me call my grandma. And I remember as they're dragging me down there, I'd ask them, why do I got to call grandma? And they said, because she calls every hospital, every institution, every jail. And then she calls all your friends. And then she calls all of us every single morning. Anybody seen Jason? Anybody know where Jason is? Is Jason alive? Can somebody please go find Jason? So you need to call her and tell her you're alive so she'll leave us alone. Right. And uh, I would call my grandma and I talk to her and I tell her, man, I'm doing really good. I have a job out of town. The life's doing really good. I'll come see you. And I tell her I come see you tomorrow. And here, I meant that with all my heart. Right. But I'm powerless over alcohol. When I put alcohol in my body, I can justify and rationalize everything. And what I say to myself is I ain't if I'm not looking at you face to face, I'm not lying to you and I'm not stealing from you. I'm doing you a favor. Right. And. Uh, Every once in a while, I'd go to my grandma's house, and this is how she was, and it took me a while to figure this out. I would go and talk with her, and she would get up and go to the bathroom, and I'd look at her purse, and there'd be like five, ten dollars hanging out, or there'd be something she knew I was going to steal it, and I stole it, right, because that's who I am, right, and, and, and I would do that over and over. What I know today is that lady had no Allen on. She had nothing. She would just go to church and pray for me, and I did that over and over and over and over, and, uh, on December probably 1st or 2nd of 1997, my Uncle Leroy, who's a big biker guy, showed up at my tent. I had got kicked out of an abandoned house, and I had to live in the backyard. I was doing really good. Right? It's popular to be in a tent now, too, I guess. But back then, it was kind of like the bottom. He shows up, and he says, hey, your grandma's been on life support for about a week or two. She's in ICU at Portland Adventist. We took her off of life support. You need to come say goodbye. We don't know if she's going to make it through the next couple of days. I said, I don't really want to go. He said, I'm not asking you. If you're going to go, you're going to go. And so he's bigger than me and meaner. So he drug me to his truck, and I get in his truck, and we're driving. And he handed me a pint of vodka, and he said, just drink this. And I chugged that vodka, and we got to that hospital. I don't know what it's like in some areas, but in this hospital, you get up, get out of the elevator. And uh, my whole family, I have a big family. They're all sitting on this side because only two or three people can go into this room at a time. And then when I get off that elevator, I don't go over there because I know I'm a piece of crap. It's not going to amount to any. I know I'm that guy. Right? I know I'm a guy. Alcohol makes that okay for me. But what I would do is I went and I sat on the other side of the room, and no one, even my mom, didn't come over and talk to me. Right? And eventually my uh, aunt came over and she said, You need to get in there, say goodbye, and get out of here. And I said, Okay. And I got up and I went in there. My Uncle Gary, a lot of the guys in here know my Uncle Gary. He, uh, he was standing there and he said, Just talk to her like she's here. You know, hold her hand, talk to her like she's here. And so I, I sat down, and I grabbed her hand, I started talking to her, and she opened her eyes and started looking at me, and I kind of, well, that's odd. And then she started talking back to me, and I panicked, right, because people are running to the door because they want to see her. They had flown in. I told her, Grandma, I'm doing really good. I got a great job. There's a lot of people here that want to see you, so I'm going to come back tomorrow and see you. And uh, I love you. And then she told me she loved me, and she was going to pray for me. But I remember as I was walking out of that room, she told my uncle, he's a good kid. You watch. He'll do something with his life. And I remember just nut nut. Right? And I was like, why doesn't she just give up on me, man? Why doesn't she just give up on me? And I went back to my tent, and I drank like you drink. A couple of days later, my Uncle Dale showed up and let me know that my grandma had passed. And he would pick me up. His family would pick me up, and I could sit with them at the memorial. I said, okay. And that day, he, his family came to pick me up. I hid in an abandoned house with some gold sauger and some Jägermeister in a closet, and I didn't come out because I was too scared. Right? And what I do is when I put alcohol in my body, I can rationalize sitting in that dark closet by myself. And I could hear them saying, you're going to regret this for the rest of your life. You know the things that they say. And I just kept drinking. Right? And they left finally, and I just kept drinking. They kept, they just left, and I kept drinking. They left, and I just kept drinking. About three or four days later, maybe a week or so, it was a Sunday morning, and alcohol was not doing anything for me. Right? I was getting drunk, but, man, the, 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 the embarrassment, the fear, the unknown, couldn't get that out of my body, right? And so I made a vital mistake. I called my Uncle Gary Collect and asked him if he was going to church because I knew he was going to beat me up, right? I fought him a lot, and I haven't won one because he's like seven years older than me. He's kind of big, and he, he, does, he has a bad temper. He's an AA, but he needs to work on that. Um, 
But I knew he wasn't going to beat me up in church, right? So I asked him, he said, yeah, meet us at church. We get there, and uh, they start singing that song, How Great Thou Art, right? Man, I kind of got caught up in the moment. I was like, oh, man, that's kind of, and then they sing that damn song, Amazing Grace, and I'm crying like a baby, right? And I look at my uncle, I said, man, I think I have a drinking problem. He's like, you, th- you think? And the whole church went quiet, right? <laughs> my Aunt Linda said the song was over. I thought everybody was just waiting for the answer, right? And I said, well, I might have a drug problem, too, if it makes you feel better about yourself. This is what he said. Come to my house. We'll feed you, wash your clothes, and uh, we'll give you 20 bucks, and you can figure out what you're going to do with your life. I said, that's great, right, because I hadn't eaten anything in a while, and I get to his house, and I take a shower, and I come out, and there's a phone book. Obviously, people that know who happy days are probably know what a phone book is, right? And, uh, and he says, you're going to call treatment centers. I go, what's that? He goes, this is no time for negotiations. Look up hospitals and call drug and alcohol treatment centers. So I called Portland Adventist because it was at the top of the page. I told this lady, hey, my uncle thinks I have a drinking problem. She got all excited on a Sunday afternoon, right? What the hell? Who works on Sunday? And she patches me over to this other lady. who I tell her I might have a drug problem, too. She's even more excited. She said, can you be here tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. to do an assessment? I said, absolutely. And so she, I get off the phone. I tell my uncle I have an assessment or something like that. Give me $20. I'll tell you how it went. He made me stay the night at his house. And... Uh, Man, it just got bad really fast. He has a leather, it's a plastic couch. It's not a leather couch. And he has a dog that licked me all night. And it's just, it was bad. The next morning, I took a shower. And when he went to take a shower, I remembered he had a liquor cabinet, man. And I started drinking, right? And I'm ready to go to whatever this is. And I get in his car and we're driving to this treatment center. He goes, man, I smell alcohol. I said, it's not me. I'm going to AA. Or not AA, but I'm going to treatment, right? And so I, I have this Coke can and I chug it because I don't want him to steal it from me. And, uh. We get to the treatment center. I made another vital mistake. I went to hide my pop can, and he went in, and he answered yes to something. I was in treatment just like that, right? It was December 29, 1997. Portland Adventist, quite possibly like prison, right? It had no caffeine, no sugar, and no women. Oh, I'm 26 years old. Those are big deals, right? And uh, I didn't know you could just leave. I, I, I thought... I, I thought it was, well, I thought it was, I thought I was watching shift changes. I was watching delivery of food. I was watching the elevator because I need to escape. This, this is a bad idea, right? And uh, as I'm sitting here doing my plan for the couple days, I hear these four, there's only four other guys in there with me, right? And I hear these guys talking about Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, what's Alcoholics Anonymous? And this is the miracle that got me to AA. They said, there's caffeine, there's sugar, and there's women. <laughs> Yeah, whatever it takes, baby. I said, how are we going to get there? They said, a van's going to pick us up and take us. I'm like, I can escape from there. This is just, this is great, right? So this Tuesday night, a guy comes up, he picks us up in this van, and I need to tell you about ah, three years before this went down, my dad called my mom out of the blue to pay back all the back child support he owed. I went to this bank to get my half of the money, which I had to pay back because of sponsorship, but I went there, I... For like 30 seconds, I said hi to this guy. I looked at him like, you're an ass, took my money, and left, right? Three years later, I'm in a van with these four guys that need to be in recovery, and we're going to this thing called a and and uh, I pray to a God I don't really believe in, but what the hell? Please don't let me know anybody in AA, and if I do, please don't let me owe him any money. No, hey, I want to get sober, and like, that's just, that's all I want out of AA, this prayer. We get to this meeting, we walk in, and he's, they were correct. There was caffeine, there was sugar, and there's some ladies in there. So I'm sitting around looking like, who am I going to marry to bust me out of this <laughs> treatment center? And I see these guys standing in the back, and I said, hey, that guy looks like my dad. And they go, you don't know who your dad is? I said, I've seen him one time in 26 years. Well, there was a break in this meeting. I don't go to meetings with breaks anymore. But I walk up to this guy, and he's standing there. I said, hey, do you know who I am? He said, nope. I said, I think you're my dad. And he said, Jason? And I said, yeah. And I met my dad at my very first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And Alice's, Alice's daughter, Teresa, over there was really good friends with my dad. Right? And, uh, you know, uh, I remember being a little kid coming home on Fridays and sitting on the front porch waiting for my mom or dad to come pick me up for the weekend. And they wouldn't come. And I remember one Friday sitting on there, and they got, the streetlight came on, and I came back in off the porch. I went in, I talked to my grandma. I said, Grandma, I'm not going to your Sunday school thing anymore. She said, why is that? I said, I've been praying to that Jesus guy every morning and every night for a week that my mom or my dad would come pick me up. And they didn't show. He don't like me. I'm done. She said, okay. And I went in, I got on my grandpa's lap, and I told my grandpa, I never want to sit on that porch again. 
He said, buddy, you never have to sit on that porch ever again if you don't want to. I said, thanks. And I made a decision right there. I don't need a God and I don't need a mom and a dad. My grandma used to always tell me these dumb things like, God never says no. He either says yes, not right now, or I got something better. Right? Dad, where do you get this stuff? Right? It's kind of like the off the wall. or I don't know if they have it at church or whatever. Right? But I'm here to tell you, 26 years later, I'm sitting on my grandpa's front porch waiting for members of Alcoholics Anonymous to come pick me up to take me to a meeting. And it's not like today where they text you or call you. They honk two blocks away, right? And they honk the whole way till they get there, right? So they want everybody to know we're saving your neighborhood. We're taking Jason to AA, right? No anonymity there, for Christ's sakes. And, uh, but here's this thing. I ran down those stairs, and I get on that curb, and that car pulls up. And you know who's there to pick me up? It's my dad. God either says, yes, not right now, or I got something better. I just have to trust the process. He took me to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous where I met this girl. I kissed her. She got pregnant. (laughs) She got divorced. We had a kid, and then we got married. (laughs) Yeah, that new guy's going, oh, shit. (laughs) That's not how you do anything in life, really, but that's what I did, you know, and I, and I started doing Alcoholics Anonymous. Look, and I, and, and I was a go-getter, man. I was going to one meeting a month. I had no sponsor, but I had this service commitment at this meeting called SSAL. Sit down, shut up, and listen. It was a big, huge speaker meeting, man, and I was on fire because I was a raffle chair, and I was stealing half the money, which I had to pay back because of sponsorship. You got to get the right, you got to watch who you sponsor, right, or get it to sponsor, and uh it was a Saturday of this big meeting. I didn't want to go, so I called. My, I got an argument with my wife, right, because she was on the committee too, and I told her that we should get a divorce. She said no. I didn't know you could just say no. I thought you had to communicate. And uh, she said, I'm going to the meeting. Maybe you should go. I said, screw AA. She went to the meeting. I did what every good member of Alcoholics Anonymous does at that age. I wrote a resignation letter to Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah, I got a Bible and a big book, and I got, I'm not a smart guy, right, but it looked good. And I got on the computer, I printed it out, I dated it, I signed it, and I put it in an envelope, and I took it. I was going to take it to this guy named John B. John B., I thought, was the president of AA in Oregon, right? Because he had a whole shitload of nautigans, right? You guys call them sponsees, I call them nautigans. You know, like, they're greeters, right? And you pull up in the parking lot, and you're like, good God, not again. They want to touch you, hug you, you know, just, Ugh. Or they get called on in the meeting, they talk about God, sponsorship, doubt. I mean, just absolutely nothing that needs anything to do with AA, in my opinion. But... And I would just say, why not again? Don't call on that guy. You know what he's going to say, right? So I, he had a bunch of nodigans, right? So I thought he was the president of AA. I walk up. It's a big meeting like this. He's standing there. I hand him my resignation letter. He opens it up. He reads it, and he starts laughing like Disneyland, right? <laughs> and then these nodigans are coming out of everywhere, right? They're, and they're passing the letter around, and they're laughing. And, and, I, and uh, I'm, just, I'm just sweating, right? I mean, there's, it's not going good, right? And all of a sudden, he says, no. I go, no? He goes, no, I'm not going to allow you to resign from Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said, huh, will you sponsor me? <laughs> not what, I, I, and man, the guy quit laughing just like that. He said, are you willing to go to any link for victory over alcohol? I'm like, Jesus, I was just resigning with a letter from AA. <laughs> That's going to haunt me for the next 25 years, right? And, uh. And he said, this is what you're going to do. You're going to get on your knees in the morning. You're going to, you're going to get on your knees. You're going to say, please help. Thank you. Amen. And at night, you're going to get on your knees and say, thanks. God don't need to hear any more from you. You'll be trying to con him. <laughs> I remember asking him, I said, what about my sobriety? Because you got warm, way more problems than alcohol, right? You're going to just do this, right? And I said, okay. He said, I had to call him every morning at 6 a.m. or 6.30. He's like, I better get a better paying job. He told me I had to read two pages out of the big book. He told me I had to go to five meetings in a week. Holy, two where he was at. And I couldn't drink in between meetings. And if I did that, my life would get better. And within 30 days, I was a nodigan, right? My job in Alcoholics Anonymous, I was the head greeter. Why well, I appointed myself as head greeter. I was at the front of the line, and my job was to shake every woman's hand that walked in the door and look her in the eye and make sure she felt safe. And every man that walked through the door... I had to hug and tell him I'm doing better every day in every way. Very awkward, very unnecessary, very uncalled for. <laughs> Some of those guys like two or three laps, right? I got hugged a lot, right? And I, yeah, I'm not a hugger then. Um, but you know what? My life got better. 
and I became a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he took me through this test. But I'm, I don't know about any of you guys. At nine years of sobriety, man, I couldn't stand going to AA. Because you guys, like she said, her, her, when her husband would go, Butch would do that. That's what I, when you guys talk, wah, 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 same thing. I know who, Alice is going to make fun of the Sherbert. Teresa is going to be mad at my dad. Timmy's going to want to go get something to eat. You know what I mean? He just, I knew everything everybody wanted to do, right? And, and, and I just couldn't stand it, right? So I sat in the back, and I judged you. And I did what every good person in AA thinks about doing. I started selling drugs. <laughs> uh, I know nobody's ever thought of selling drugs in Mexico before, but uh, I did. And I got pretty good at it. Right? And uh, one day I bought a car. I took it to this place called Les Schwab. I put some wheels and tires on it. I pulled out of Les Schwab's parking lot, and the wheel fell off, and I crashed. Yeah, it got kind of hectic there for a second. But Les Schwab said, it's our fault. We'll rent you a Chrysler. They rented me a car. It was a Chrysler 300. It looked like a Rolls Royce. It said Hemi on the side. I thought I had arrived. I get in this car, and I go meet this guy I've been meeting every day for about a year. I was driving down the road, and all of a sudden, all these police cars swore my car. I guess they call it a task force. Um, and there's a lot of them. Right, and they're so warm. My car, and I have a well. This police report said 157 grams of meth. Right, so I have this small basketball of meth, and I'm thinking to myself, "Huh, I've never been in this car before, so I'll just put it under the front seat because I have a valid driver's license, proof of insurance. It's a rental car. I've only had it for like an hour, and I haven't had a drink or drug in nine years. I should be able to talk my way out of this, right?" So I put it underneath the seat, and finally, an officer walks up to the thing, and he taps the window. I roll it down because I didn't want them to know I knew they were there, and he said, "Jason." which is another bad sign. He didn't even ask me for my ID. He said, Jason, can you shut the car off and step up on the curb? And I said, yeah. So I shut that car off, and I opened up the door to get out, and as I'm getting out of here, I, and I look down, and the seat's moving back all by itself. <laughs> yeah, you can't yell do-over or time out. You know what I mean? You sure as I can't reach down there and try to get, you know. And so I'm just thinking, uh-oh, right? This is not good. And so I, I shut the door, hoping they wouldn't see it, and I went up on the curb. And they did, and I got charged with commercial delivery, commercial possession, racketeering, intimidation of a federal witness, and a gun charge with nine years of sobriety going to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous judging you. And I burned it to the ground. Burned it to the ground. I got out on a pretrial release, and I put a needle in my arm, and I started drinking like I knew it, didn't know how to drink. I did things I said I would never do. And I burned it to the ground. My wife divorced me. <laughs> I used to think that was a bad call. AA thought it was a great call. She has remarried me. I think it's a great call. Hey, he thinks that's a bad call. But uh, <laughs> there's some people in here that know her, and they're like going, yeah, I don't know why you'd marry him again, right? Uh, and uh, I ended up getting sentenced to 48 months in prison. And I'm here to tell you that the first three weeks I got put in the hole by myself, and it, it saved my life. Because in there I had anxiety, I had fear, I was scared to death. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I was going to be in there for four years. And I heard John's voice say, get on your knees, dummy. And I got on my knees, and I said, please help, thank you, amen. And I got on that bunk, and if I got any kind of relief, I got back down, and I said, thanks. And I started doing that over and over. About day three, I looked in this little shiny, shiny thing they had. I looked in there, and for the first time in my life, I admitted I'm a powerless over alcohol. And my life's unmanageable. I didn't tell anybody else, just me, right, and God. And my life changed just like that. But three months and 27 days of a 48-month sentence, I got... Some judges in the program of Alcoholics and Anonymous in my area signed some papers. They had my other judge sign some papers. They got me a suspended sentence, and I was allowed to serve my time in the state of Oregon. And uh, all I had to do was get sober and get a job, and I've been an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. There's a lot of people here from my area. Somewhat good standing. You know what? I, would, I, used to, I usually say good standing, but they're here, so it might be somewhat good standing. It just depends. Some of them, there's a couple times Rob's told me, boy, today you just didn't drink. You know what I mean? But... Uh, <laughs> and if you know what that means, you know what that means, right? And, uh, you know, and I got out and I got my wife back. I got my kid back. And look, one of my lowest points in my life was when uh, that thing is my daughter was seven years old when I got put to jail. And before I got sentenced to prison, my wife obviously kicked me out and she'd let me come over and see my daughter every now and then if I looked like I wasn't going to mow lawn with a flashlight on my hat or sort bolts in the garage, right? You know what I mean? She'd let me come over and see her. And I remember when my daughter was born, we saved those quarters with the states on the back and we had a couple buckets of them. I remember coming out of the shower, and here comes my wife and my daughter down the hallway, and my wife's going, you stole your daughter's money. Who steals a little kid's money? But alcohol can rationalize that, right? Because that money wouldn't be there if I didn't put it there. But my daughter's tugging on my wife's pants saying, please don't make my daddy leave. I let him borrow it. 
when she was born, I remember holding her and telling her, you'll never want for anything and nobody will ever hurt you. And what I did to her is what I told her nothing would happen. And I got out of there and I went and did what I did. You know, and when I got out, I had to make that stuff right. You know, I'm here to tell you that I, I, I'm, my daughter's 25 years old. She just graduated from college with her master's and she's getting ready to go to law school. And uh, she wants to be a, a judge. And uh, <laughs> she's by the book, though. She's not even going to expunge anything for me. She doesn't work like that. Well, it will. We just have to figure it out, right? <laughs> and uh, she's clerking for four judges right now who pay for their last two years of college. And I remember a couple, oh, man, maybe six months ago, I'm walking through the kitchen. There's a bunch of these girls from the college are there. They're trying to talk my daughter into running for president of the United States. It was at Portland State, right? So I heard president of the United States. I said, hey, can I have a cabinet position? She said, no. She didn't even hesitate, right? She didn't say no. I said, well, what can I do at the White House? She said, you could be a greeter. <laughs> yeah. You better get there fast. I probably won't have the job for long, right? But, uh, you know, I'm not the best dad in the world. Yeah, I tell this story. Somebody asked me if I tell it. it. Look, my daughter, when my daughter was 17 years old, my wife came to me and said, hey, we're going to go on vacation. I said, where are we going? They said, Canada. At that time, I couldn't get into Canada, right? And uh, I said, I can't get into Canada. They said, we know. <laughs> and away they went, right? And they're on vacation. They're gone for like two weeks, right? I'm dog sitting my own dogs. And my wife said that I was watching my dogs. I didn't dog sit them. And, uh. They're gone, and they come home, and my daughter goes straight to her room, and my wife comes in the kitchen and says, we need to talk. I said, all right. She said, no, I need to talk to you, and it's serious. I think, well, maybe she's moving to Canada. I don't know. She fell in love or something. She goes, uh, when we were up in Canada, Bailey got a tattoo. Oh, I wasn't ready for that. I saw a tramp stamp. I saw stripper poles. I saw Aerosmith videos. I, uh, I saw red. I saw violence, and I, told, I called my wife names. I probably shouldn't call her. I told her, we're getting divorced. You're going to jail. How in the hell am I going to get that tattoo off her back, right? And I went upstairs, and I, I, man, I said stuff to my daughter that if you said to her, I don't, I'm not afraid to go back to jail, right? And I said things to her, and she sat on that bed, and she just cried. And so I, got, I, I, I went back, back downstairs to argue with my wife some more, and she told me to go for a ride. And what I did is I got in my car, and I called an Al-Anon, right? Because I figured Al-Anon would know how to get my wife arrested, probably get divorced, and know how they've probably gotten tattoos removed somewhere. I'm not the first person that had this problem, right? But I call that Alan on 11 a door, and I'm explaining to her, and here, look, AA, if I tell Dave the problem, he gives me the solution before I'm even done explaining, right? I tell Larcina problem, I don't know if they write it down, think about it, send texts out, get more, it, take, it took like two miles before I got any kind of response to what I've been saying. And she said, you want to know what just happened? I said, well, did you hear? I told you it four times. She said, well, and you just told your daughter she's not beautiful, and any decisions she makes are not to you. I mean, she went. She made me sound bad, right? And I said, well, I didn't mean that. What do I got to do? She said, you got to go make that right. And I could hear her husband in the background going, you better invite God to go with you. So I'm driving down the road going like this. I don't need AA's help. That's what got me in this problem. And uh, I get back to my house, and I sit in that driveway, and I invite God to go with me. And I go in there, and I tell my wife I overreacted. She said, you did. And I go upstairs, and my daughter's sitting on her bed, and she's still crying at 17 years old. And I had to apologize until I'm an idiot, Right? I don't care what you believe in. I don't care who you love. I don't give a rat anything. All you need to know is I love you no matter what, and you're the best thing I've ever done in this world. She said, I know, Dad. She goes, you want to see the tattoo? <laughs> sure. And she lifts up her shirt, and on the side of her chest, there's an AA symbol that says one day at a time. Aww. Yeah. And there's a hand going like this and a hand going like this. My inside voice says, God, I hope you're not an alcoholic. And what's with the praying hands? We're not Catholic. But those are inside voices. I just said, oh. She goes, you want to know what it means? I said, sure. She said, if it wasn't for Alcoholics Anonymous, you and mom would have never met, and I wouldn't be here. I was like, oh, that's pretty good, right? She said, the hand going like this is mom's hand because she's always making the cookies and serving the coffee at the meeting. And the hand like this is yours, dad, because you're always welcoming people to Alcoholics Anonymous and giving them a hand up. So now I'm sitting on the edge of this stupid bed crying. <laughs> This lady, Polly Pistol, said that was God kicking me in the nuts. <laughs> that's why I was sitting down, right? And uh, that's just a typical day at my house, right? You and Alcoholics Anonymous, you taught me how to be a better person. And some days I have good days, and some days I just don't drink. You know, I need to get the men's of my grandparents, right? Uh, this is the good stuff, right? People say four is hard, nine's hard, right? Nine and 12, because I have to deal with people, right? And... Uh, 
I go to my grandpa's house. I said, hey, grandpa, I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous and these things called the steps and I have to make amends to you. I owe you some money. He goes, I know. I said, I don't know how much money I owed you because I stole a lot of money and borrowed a lot of money from you and grandma. He goes, I know how much. I go, how? He goes into my grandma's room. He comes back with these spiral notebooks. My grandma was like the mob. <laughs> she had wrote down from 1970s. Jason borrowed 25 cents. Jason moved the lawn. He has 10 cent credit. Jason stole $5. I mean, Every IOU, it's ridiculous, right? I'm thinking, dude, who does that, right? And uh, and there's like a stack of these things, and I'm just looking at them. I was like, Jesus, Christ, I can't. I mean, there was, I, I, I bought a lot of stuff, right? I said, I can't pay all that back. He goes, I know. I said, what can I do? He says, you just keep helping people. I was like, great, I can do that. But I'm looking in this book, and it says 1984, Jason stole $5. 19, Jason stole five dollars. Jason stole five dollars. I said, I said, hey, Grandpa, how do you know I stole the five dollars? He goes, oh, that's an easy one. Every fr- Thursday morning, I put five dollar. Every Thursday night, I put five dollars in the coffee cup in the hutch. Every Friday morning, it was gone. Only you, me, and Grandma lived here. Do you think Grandma stole it? <laughs> I said, no. Oh. But I said, Grandpa, if you knew I stole it, why didn't you tell me to quit? He goes, I asked you many times, Jason, and you told me you didn't steal it. I said, but you knew I did. And this is what the guy who I thought hated me and was always out to get me set. I would rather, Jason, he said, Jason, stealing isn't wrong till it's wrong to you. And I'd rather you steal from me than our, your neighbors and your friends. And I left his house thinking, my God, he, I think he loved me. And I got in my car and I called my sponsor. He said, how much do you have to pay back? I said, nothing. So I went back. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Grandpa, that's not going to work. And so we made a deal. I ended up buying cable TV till the day he died. And uh, when he got cable TV, about two weeks after that, he calls my house. He asked me if I had cable TV. I told him, Grandpa, everybody has cable TV but you. And uh, we talked about Pawn Stars. We talked about the History Channel. We talked about ESPN being on 24 hours a day. And uh, we talked for probably an hour. And at the end of that conversation, he said, this is the greatest gift anybody's ever given me. And I was making amends, right? And uh, when he died, we were good. My grandma, on the other hand, I didn't know how to make that amends. Right? I wrote letters. I sat with Howard P. for a whole weekend. Uh, I went to the gray side. I looked for dragonflies, butterflies, ants, potato bugs. <laughs> I tried everything, man. But I couldn't. You know, in the Keys of King that says I ache so down deep inside, I couldn't kick that embarrassment, that shame, and that guilt. Right? And what I did to the only person I believed at that time loved me. And uh, and I, 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 it went on like this for like, probably 10 years, and then one day I'm flying back from a conference, and this guy, Jimmy Jack, sends me a, a, a story about something, because he knows I'm the kind of guy, if you give me clear-cut directions, sometimes I go, huh, and I don't do it, right? That's how I got the name, For Christ's Sakes, Jason. But if you tell me a story, and I can feel it, you got me, right? So I'm on this plane, and I start reading this story, and it's about this little boy, and he's the firstborn in his family. His d- sisters were born, and his dad started paying attention to his sisters, and he got jealous, but he knew his dad loved football. So he went and asked his parents if he could play football, and they signed him up, and right away it was a bad idea. He's a trumpet player, really. And, uh, but he plays football because after every single practice and every single game, his dad would come find him and give him a hug and tell him he loved him and how proud he was of him. And so the little boy kept playing all the way to high school. His senior year, his team's going to the state championship. It's a couple weeks before the big game, and they're at practice, and the coach calls him over and says, son, I don't know how to tell you this, but uh, your dad had a heart attack today, and he didn't make it. And the young man hit his knees, and he's crying, and everybody's gathering around the team. And he gets up, and he asks the coach, is it okay if I go home a little early today? The coach said, man, this is just a game. Go take care of your family. Don't worry about the football. And the young man went, and the day of the big game came. It's like the third quarter. His team's losing, and he didn't show up. And then he finally shows up like at the end of the third quarter. And everybody's cheering. He runs up, and he asks the coach, can I play? And the coach said, sure, get in there. We're losing anyway. And the kid intercepts the ball and runs it back for a touchdown. Then he makes some tackles, and he ends up winning the game for his team. The worst player in their school history ends up winning the state championship. And uh, that night when the coach is leaving the locker room, he sees a young man sitting in the back, and he walks over. He says, man, take as long as you need. The young man says, thanks, coach. And the coach says, I need to ask you something. You're not really the best athlete I've ever coached. What happened out there tonight? I say, coach, I don't know if you know this or not, but every game, even the ones you didn't play me and I sat on the bench or I lost the game for us, no matter what, my dad would come give me a hug and tell me he loved me and he was proud of me. And the coach said, you had a great dad. And the young man says, I know. And as the coach is walking away, the young man says, Coach, I don't know if you know this or not, but my dad was blind, and tonight's the first night he ever really got to see me play. And just like that, just like that, I got relief. 
right? Because I know every time I walk into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and I say, my name's Jason Johnson, I'm an alcoholic, my grandma gets to participate in that. Every time I walk in, I see somebody I haven't seen before, like Scott said, I walk over and I ask them, what's your name? Can I get you a cup of coffee? Can I sit by you? Right? If you're in a meeting of alcoholics and you don't feel like you fit, come sit by me. Right? Come sit by me. And uh, I don't know how, I don't ever want to be able to pay that debt, but it changed my life. You know, I know that when I die and I go to that big meeting in the sky, that's the first place I'm going, right? Because I want to find out if there's a Bill of Bob and a Jesus, right? <laughs> and uh, if there isn't, I'll let you know somehow, right? And, uh, and I, know what my, I know what's going to happen. My grandparents are going to be waiting in the parking lot to greet me. And my grandpa, if you're not a half hour early, you're late, so I don't know how that works when you're dead, but he'll wave at me because he thinks I never know where I'm going, Right? And for the first time as an adult, I'm going to be able, because I've been hugging the men in Alcoholics Anonymous when it wasn't convenient or necessary and telling them I love them. I'm going to be able to hug my grandpa for the first time and thank him for giving me a safe place to live and most importantly, telling him I love him. My grandma, on the other hand, she's going to be praising Jesus and thanking God and telling my grandpa, I told you so, and whatever you do when you're up there, right? And I know what she's going to do. She's going to hug me. She's going to kiss me. and She's going to tell me she loves me and she's proud of me. For the first time, I'm going to be able to look my grandma in the eye and say, Grandma, it's the damnedest thing. These people in this program called Alcoholics Anonymous, they found a solution to their problem, and they introduced it to me. But most importantly, Grandma, some of those people showed me some grace. And in doing that, they introduced me to that kid inside of here that you believed only existed. That might not be a big deal to you, but if your alcoholic is powerless over alcohol and you've traded everything that has any dignity or respect away, it's a big deal share one more story it just happened to me about four months ago I had to go speak at the Indiana State Convention I get there it's like five states and it's all the GSRs and the delegate yeah it's not me right I mean it's like all the business of AA and they're like all excited and I'm like oh Jesus they got the wrong guy right I even told the guy who was my host hey I'll pay my own flight home and you guys need to find another speaker because this is not my gig right I steal money from AA I'm not a, I should not be voting on anything right and uh, there's a slogan like this that says, a seat for everyone. I thought that's going to bite them in the ass in about 48 hours, right? <laughs> but I stayed, right? And I started participating. I went to every event, man, and I had a great time. I had a great time. I sat some, by some people that taught me that, man, this is a good deal, right? And uh, that night that banquet came, and I, and I gave my talk. And after the talk, I, they have this thing we talk about. We call it a gratitude line. I don't know why they call it a gratitude line because I was telling Lord, seeing 10% of the people don't like it, Right? Like 5% are like just got done telling their, their sponsor, hey, that's an hour of my life I won't get back. And he's like, go, go thank him for that, right? So they're coming up like, hey, yeah, I'm not hugging you. And they walk by. And then there's always that person that just, you offended, right? And so I'm in this line, and, and it's at one of these, that convention where these all people thank you, right? That's what they do. They're the service junkies, right? And they're coming, and they're coming. And so I look up to see how long this line's going because I'm hungry, right? And I look, and this lady catches eye contact me, so I put my head down because it was that awkward kind of contact, right? Kind of like, yeah, right here, right? <laughs> and so I look down, and I look up again, and she's staring at me. I'm like, oh, that's her. She's pissed. She's like Margo was at the airport, right? Just wants to kill me, right? As soon as I saw her, I knew I'm in trouble. And uh, so I just keep my head down. I don't look. And, 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 and she should be here by now, right? And so I look up, and she's not there. And I'm like, oh. I look, and she's at the back of the line staring at me. I'm like, oh, shit, right? So now all I can focus on is I wonder what I said, what I did. And people are like, hey, thank you, Brad, whatever. But, you know, you, we, you know what I mean? I'm scared, right? And uh, we get down, and it's just her and I, and we're standing there, and she's looking at me, and I'm looking at her. And she says to me, I'm a grandma. Can I give you a hug? I said, absolutely, right? <laughs> I didn't want to tell her. I thought you were going to kill me, right? But... <laughs> And uh, we started talking. She has a 24-year-old granddaughter who's out there running and gunning, and people are saying a lot of bad things about her. And she's doing a lot of bad things with her body. But she's her granddaughter, and she loves her. Come to find out she's not a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and she's not a member of Al-Anon. She was there because a friend from her church had prayed for her granddaughter every Sunday. Her and her husband had banquet tickets, and her husband got sick, and she invited her to come hear a story of hope. And so we stood there, right, and we talked a little bit more. And when she went to walk away, she goes, she turns around. She goes, hey, do you know why your grandma wrote all that stuff down in them books? I said, no. She goes, I know why. I said, why is that? She said, because your grandma knew no matter all the bad things people were saying about you, 
to all the bad things you were doing that one day you would come back and make that right. I'm trying not to cry. I'm trying to bite my lip. She looked right at me. She said, I'm proud of you. And she walked off, right? And I sat down. I'm here to tell you this. I started crying. I wasn't crying. I was crying because I think I just made amends to my grandma in life, right? Because that lady was the same age as my grandma probably was when I was 24 years old, and she had the same thing. And I got the ability to do that. You know, and I'm laying, sitting in this chair, and I look, and I see these big feet sitting next, standing next to me. And I look up, and there's this big guy just standing there crying. I'm like, oh, shit, right? So I get up, and he's like, I heard that. I felt that. He goes, I got goosebumps when she was talking to you. I said, well, that's God giving you a hug and telling you you're welcome, right? Because that's the only thing I was scared too, right? And, he, and we talked about it. He said, I have 60 days of sobriety, and that's the first time I've ever felt something like that. And I thought to myself, my God, that's the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the buzz. I hope everybody in here at one time in their life Gets that feeling, right? And I hope it's that one day when you're looking in the mirror and you're all right with yourself. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.